If you enjoy developing in Rust, you probably like catching issues at compile time instead of in production in the middle of the night. So let's talk about testing. Testing in Rust revolves around three main concepts. The first is the test annotation that you actually annotate your test functions with. The second is the family of assert macros that validate your expectations for the test. And the third is the cargo test command that you actually use to run your tests. Cargo tests will run all functions annotated with the test macro and report the results back to you. Invocations of the assert function macro will dictate whether the test succeeds or fails. There's also mocking, which Rust doesn't actually come with out of the box, so you will need a framework for that, and we'll cover that more toward the end of the video. First, let's talk about how tests are organized. Generally speaking, your test function will be run as long as it's annotated with the test macro. Despite that, there are some conventions and idioms that the Rust community has established in terms of how you organize your tests. The first convention is that integration tests generally go in the tests directory, which is a directory that's parallel to your SRC directory. None of the code in the tests directory will actually make it into the final release binary, so you don't need to worry about that. All you need to do is make sure you annotate your functions with that test macro. So let's say we have a library crate and we want to make a simple function called compute answer that takes in an i32 and returns an i32. We're calling the numeric parameter for this function question. And you can imagine this is a function that does some long running computation, but for our purposes, for this example, we're just gonna have it return 42. So say we wanna write an integration test for this function. And again, integration tests by convention are generally put in a tests directory that's parallel to the source directory. So let's go ahead and create that directory tests and we're going to create a new file and we're going to call it um, compute answer test.rs. So we're just going to create a regular function. Answer should be 42. It's just going to validate that compute answer returns 42. Again, right now, the way it's written, compute answer will always return 42, regardless of the value of the argument that you pass in. We do need to add a use statement to grab the, the actual function. And then the last thing we need to do is annotate this test function with the test macro. That's what that looks like. Now let's go ahead and see how this runs with cargo test. Okay, test result okay, one passed. And if we expect 41, compute answer is gonna return 42 and we should have the test fail. Yep, it says the test panicked because the left side was 42 and the right side was 41. Okay, now this isn't really an integration test, it's more of a unit test because it's just testing one function, but this gives you an idea of where you should put your integration tests. One of the things to be aware of when writing integration tests is that integration tests can't actually invoke private functions. And integration tests in general shouldn't be calling private functions anyway, but it's something to be aware of. So if I go into lib.rs and I take away pub, on compute answer, my test will no longer compile. Uh, it says it's private. And that brings us to unit tests, which can actually invoke private functions. Unit tests by convention are generally placed in the same file as the code being tested. This can be a little uncomfortable if you're coming from another language where the idiomatic way to write unit tests is to place it in a completely separate directory tree uh, with file names that match the code being tested. In Rust, the idiomatic way to do things is to put it in the same file as the code you're testing. So in this example, if I wanted to write a unit test, the idiomatic way to do things is actually should create another module in this module. So mod tests. And then we don't want this test module to be compiled and packaged into the release binary. So we're gonna add this macro, the CFG macro, which says only include this in the binary if the test flag is enabled. And cargo test has that test flag enabled. So that's what'll allow this to only be compiled when you run cargo test. So we're gonna write the same test that we already did, just this time it's gonna be in the same file as the code we're testing. So we're still gonna have that same test macro. And then our function. Generally in this test module, we're gonna do use super clone clone star. And that's gonna pull in everything from this file that we wanna test, in this case, compute answer. Notice that compute answer is actually a private function and we can get away with invoking this in our test because in Rust, submodules can actually invoke functions of parent modules even if they're private. So we've seen this assert equals function that takes two arguments and all it does is compare the arguments to see if they're equal and it fails the test if they're not. There's two other common assert macro functions that you might use in your tests. There's assert not equals, we're asserting that it's not 41, so that'll fail the test if it is 41. And then there's just assert. So assert not equals is the same as assert equals, takes two arguments, validates that they're not equal. And then the plain assert macro takes a Boolean statement that evaluates the true or false and will fail the test if it's false. There's two other macros that you can annotate your test function with that might also come in handy. There's should panic, 
which fails the test if it doesn't panic. So if you want to test the code path that is expected to panic, you'd annotate your test function with should panic. So in this example, I'll change 42 to a panic run the test and we can see it passed. So we expected compute answer to panic. And if we didn't panic, it would actually fail the test. So let's change it back to 42 and test. And yeah, the test failed, did not panic as expected. The other macro that can come in handy is the ignore macro. So if you wanna temporarily disable a test, you can just slap the ignore macro on it instead of taking the time to comment the entire function out or something like that. There is also a way to deliberately run only the ignored tests that I'll get to in a minute. Up until this point, we've been having our IDE run our tests for us. Now let's take a look at the cargo test command. If you just want to run all your tests, you can just run cargo test. And we see our test passed. You can also run a subset of your tests by passing basically a search term. So cargo tests answer. We'll run all the tests with a function name that includes the string answer. So that run our test. That can really come in handy if you have a ton of tests and maybe some of them take a long time to run and you're really focused on you know one or two. You can just pass that search term in and it'll only run the ones that you're interested in. Now with cargo test, there are some arguments that you pass to cargo and there are some arguments that you pass to the generated test binary. And to distinguish between those two, you use dash dash. So if I want to pass something to the test binary, um, I would do dash dash and then everything after that point would go to the test binary. And there's two interesting arguments that you can pass to the test binary that we're going to talk about now. The first is number of threads. So we can do test threads equals one, and that'll make sure that our tests are run in serial. So we only allocate one thread to our tests. We could choose to do threads equals four if we want to run them concurrently. The other interesting argument that we can pass to the test binary is ignored. So Ignored will only run tests that have that ignored annotation on it. That can really come in handy if you've ignored one or two tests because they've been failing, but you think you fixed the issue and you just want to run the ignored ones. Um, you can do cargo test dash dash and then dash dash ignored. So that's the basics of cargo test. Now let's talk about mocking. Mocking can really come in handy for unit tests because it allows you to isolate one part of your system and test that part of the system in isolation, irrespective of the dependencies that part of the system has on the rest of the system. So imagine compute answer is in this structure called big computer. So we're gonna do struct big computer, and then this is gonna be the implementation for big computer. Big computer doesn't have any fields. And this compute answer function is going to take a reference, a borrowed reference to self, and it's still just going to return 42. It does the same thing it did before. And then we have a function in this crate called get answer. And get answer takes a computer and a question as input and returns a string. And all get answer is going to do is return a printable string containing the answer that the big computer came up with. So. Okay, so we'd like to test this get answer function in isolation, but get answer depends on big computer. And so without mocking, we would have to construct a big computer, which in our case is pretty easy, but in a real world scenario, big computer might be very complicated and compute answer might take a long time, but we just want to validate that get answer does what it's supposed to do. So we'd like to mock big computer. So without mocking, our test might look like this. We're going to have to construct a big computer, which again, in this scenario, it's straightforward, but in a real world situation, it might not be. And then we're going to assert that it returns or it yeah returns the answer is 42. So this works. This is fine. But again, we want to remove the dependency on big computer. Big computer should never be explicitly constructed during this test because we're testing get answer in isolation, ideally. And so we want to mock big computer. There's a popular Rust mocking framework called mock all. So we're going to go ahead and add that to our project. We're going to do cargo add mock all. OK, so let's make sure it's in our Tomo file. Yep. There it is. So we did cargo add from the command line. Mocking in Rust can get a little tricky. Mock all can automatically generate mocks for structs, but things look a little cleaner when we mock traits. So we're actually gonna convert big computer into a trait. So now that we've converted big computer to a trait and get answer takes a big computer as its first parameter, we don't actually even need to implement big computer to write tests for get answer. So we want mock all to automatically generate mocks for the big computer trait. First, we're gonna add some use statements. And then we're gonna use a macro called auto mock on big computer. 
and this generates the mocks for us. So what mock all does when you annotate a trait with auto mock is it actually creates a implementation of that trait prefix with the term mock. So in this case, it's gonna be mock big computer. So we'll go ahead and create a mock in our test. The generated mock has this new function that we can use to create new instances of it. Mock all will also generate functions on the implementation of our trait prefixed with the term expect. So in this case, we have one function or one method, compute answer. So mock all in its implementation that it creates, mock big computer, it's gonna have a function called expect compute answer. And that's what you use to mock out that method. When you call expect compute answer, we're gonna specify how many times we expect that function to be called, and we're gonna specify what we want that function to return. We're going to specify how many times we expect it to be called by using the times function. And then if we just want it to return a fixed value, no matter what it gets passed, we can do return const. So it's going to return 42. There's a lot more things you can do with expect that I'm not gonna go over in this video. For example, you can expect that a certain argument's passed into the function when it gets called. You can actually call a different return function that takes a closure, so you can do some custom computation in there. But for this example, we're gonna keep things simple. So when our test is run, we're gonna expect compute answer to be called one time. We're gonna have a return 42. So now when we call get answer, we're gonna pass in our mock. And so now at this point, this should run as is. Yep, test passed. Things we can do to show that this times is working. So if we set times, if we expect compute answer to be called twice, which isn't gonna happen because get answer only calls it once, we'll set times a two and make sure it fails. And it does. We can see compute answer is called one time, which is fewer than the expected two. We can also have the mock return something other than what we expect. So let's have it return 41. And that fails as well. We can see the left side says the answer is 41 and the right side says the answer is 42. Mocking can actually get pretty complicated and mock all seems like it has features to handle most use cases, but this is a simple example of how to get started. So that's been a quick rundown of testing and mocking in Rust. Hope you all liked it and we'll see you in the next one.